What's the sort of contour of a basic program that anybody could think about as a starting place? I, I think it's like a 60-40 split, which would be leaning towards uh, weight training. And then, you know, the conditioning aspect would be about 40%. So if you look at it over a course of a training week, I mean, five days in a gym would be a great task. And obviously not in the gym, it could be done at home, but three days strength training, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, conditioning, Tuesday, Thursday. And in terms of the duration of those workouts, What's your suggestion? We try to keep our workouts to an hour or less, if possible. Now, depending upon the split that you're following, if you're on a total body split, there's just gonna be more that has to be done in a given amount of time. Um, that, and again, if you're training primarily for strength, that could prolong the workout because the longer rest times in between sets. But in general, when you're not focused on that one aspect, but the overall health picture, then you can get the job done in, in, under, in under an hour. In terms of splits, you mentioned splits. And so for those who aren't familiar with this uh, term splits, it's really uh, which body parts are are you training on which days for me the first rule is will you stick to it right like if you because there are split i don't i don't particularly like full body splits i don't necessarily like to have to train everything now of course the volumes will come down per muscle group but if you don't like to do that and you actually don't look forward to your workout because you're dreading having to do everything and feeling maybe too fatigued by the time your workout's over or the fact that those generally do take a little bit longer and don't fit into your schedule i don't care how effective the split is a split not done is not effective so you need to find one that fits. So maybe you go into an alternative option like a, um, a push pull legs, like you mentioned. And that could be done either one cycle through the week on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday split, or it could be twice in a week. So you're actually training six times. How would you incorporate cardiovascular work into the overall weekly regimen? Um, so again, I, I think that the, you know, the bare minimum is probably twice a week in terms of cardiovascular. If you want to have some semblance of cardiovascular conditioning. One of the most important things I learned from you uh, over the years was that when training to increase muscle size, to really think not so much about moving weights, but more about challenging muscles. But the other thing that I learned from you that uh, I combined with that was this idea that certain muscles will grow better and get stronger much more easily, maybe even will recover better because of our ability to contract them really hard. If you can flex your bicep to the point where it hurts a little bit, like it almost feels like a cramp or a cramp, or you can flex your calf to the point where it really cramps up a little bit, almost feels like it's nodding up. That's a pretty good indication that you're going to be able to stimulate that muscle well under load if you're doing the movement properly. This mind-muscle connection is a real thing when it comes to predicting results and that you can get better at it. Your mind-muscle connection on not just your mind with one muscle, but on every exercise matters and it varies from exercise to exercise. But when you're trying to create muscle hypertrophy, you need to seek ways to make it feel more uncomfortable. But as you mentioned, practice does help. And the more you become you know, consistent and deliberate with what you're trying to do, the more of, an, of a result you actually get. How would you kind of dictate when a muscle's recovered that different muscles recover at different rates? And I've always been so fascinated by this concept. Um, I feel like what we really need, the holy grail to, to training is going to be when we're able to crack the code on an individual basis when a muscle is recovered and that is going to dictate its training schedule. Using muscle soreness as a guideline for that is, is one of the only tools we have in terms of the local level. When's the best time to stretch for particular types of results? And maybe you could define some of the different types of stretching. In general, the two basic forms of stretching are active stretching and passive stretching. Passive stretching is done with the goal of trying to create an increase uh, in uh, the flexibility of the muscles. That is usually done at a time far away from your workout because they have shown where this type of stretching done prior to an activity can impair performance. Dynamic stretching is really not done for that purpose of trying to create any type of feeling of uh, act or, or increasing the, the potential length, as you said, of the muscle, but more so the readiness of the muscle to perform. Uh, one of the great uh, tools that I, I uh, picked up from your content, which is, I think I used to hold uh, weights sometimes in the in the tips of my fingers as yeah. opposed to in the meat of the palm of my yeah. hands, and I had elbow pain. Turns out, I, toward the end of my pull-ups or my bicep work, I was letting the weight or the bar drift into my fingertips. Yeah. And the mere um, shift to making sure that my knuckles were well over the bar or that the weight was really in the meat of my palms has completely ameliorated that. This is um, because it just shows again how intricate the body is and how responsive or over-responsive it can be to something so little. It's one of the most common inflammatory conditions people get from the gym, and it all comes from this positioning of the dumbbell or barbell or hand on a pull-up bar over time. So the easiest thing to do is just grip deeper so that what you're doing is you're using uh, you know more leverage from the palm to encapsulate the bar or the dumbbell or whatever. And whenever someone feels that, the best thing would be to determine 
okay, what exercises was I doing that were pulling and where the bar could have drifted deeper there into either further from the meat of my palm into my fingers and figure out a way to deepen that grip. It does seem like cold water immersion immediately after hypertrophy or strength workouts might be a problem, but a cold shower is probably yeah. not a problem. What about heat? What are your thoughts on the use of heat and or cold? Um, well, I think, you know, we in baseball, we used a lot of cold following performance, you know, just because the, the idea would be there, there is some, especially pitchers, you know, there is some inflammation um, that is abnormal. You know, the arm is not really designed to do what they do, especially at the, at the speed that they move it and everything else. So we would use, you know, ice as a pretty standard practice after that. Um, but not, not a lot of heat, you know, and I don't really use a lot of heat. And of course, from the recovery or the, the, the healing aspect, that actually becomes rather personal preference they've found now after let's say the first 12 to 24 hours you know where you're really trying to control inflammation of what you know might be an injury but then it then it can kind of shift the personal preference because the heat can bring blood to the area also and then the you know the the, the cold has its sort of anti uh inflammatory effects and we cover the topic of the cold showers and to try to dispel the myth of the you know even people saying that there's giant testosterone releases and you know all kinds of stuff that i think the idea of just turning the water cold and being in it for 30 seconds and then all of a sudden magically growing three times your size is intriguing for a lot of people. I confess I have my slow workouts and my faster workouts um, and they scale with whether or not I'm training heavier with longer rests. Uh, do you recommend people keep training journals? So I probably inherently have the ability to stick to these guidelines in terms of rest time to know what I lifted, but journaling and keeping track of that raises awareness to where like, oh my God, I, I, I have been on you know uh, Instagram for the last seven minutes and I was supposed to be back at my next set in 90 seconds. You know, you want to get a specific effect just like any other experience experiment that you're doing. Whenever we have an objective goal, it's a lot easier to actually obtain it. But when they get bitten by that training bug and they start to see actual changes and results, you know how empowering that is? So anything you can do to increase your awareness of it and keep you on track with that is like I'm endorsing fully. Up to now, they're saying, you know, three to four hours after training, five hours after training, you can still see, the, you know, the benefits of, of re replenishment. I think it's important to get one of the two, you know, right, or at least make sure you're, you're consistently uh, 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 having one or the two, or you might risk going through all these periods of, of having no nutrition to support your efforts. But I do think you should have protein surrounding your